a lot of people talk about the armadillo. You know, we had a chance to play there a lot. And uh, I got a chance to see a lot of great artists come through the armadillo. That was where all the blues guys started playing. You know, got a chance to see Freddie King several times. Uh, I remember I was sitting out in the, bar, in the beer garden uh, and they had a great beer garden out there and we're still, beer was real, they were selling, you know, pictures of Sean Bach for a dollar and Big Ricky was knocking out all these wonderful nachos. Anyway, that's kind of like where you often had dinner if you didn't have much money. And uh, so I'm watching this band load in and, and I went up to the uh, ticket office and asked who it was. It was a band called Bruce Springsteen. I said, well, how much is the cover? And they said a dollar. And so I said, well, I think I can afford that. And so uh, stuff like that just always happened in Austin. Uh, police came in and played the armadillo. They were in a, in a Dodge Maxi van humping their own gear, you know, loading into the armadillo. People like that were getting, you know, they'd, they'd, it was a perfect venue. If you really couldn't, have, if you really didn't have enough of a draw to maybe play the, the Coliseum or the auditorium, something like that, the armadillo would hold a thousand people pretty comfortably, you know, and so that was a, a good uh, place for a lot of bands coming through to get, to get more well known than they were. And, um, so the armadillo is definitely, you know, everybody knows about that place. Uh, Eddie Wilson, of course, and uh, uh, he went on to, to have his restaurants, you know, and stuff like that. But let me see more stuff about the awesome music scene. Soap Creek continued to be a wonderful place for people to people to come through and play. And I saw the meters there. I saw, you know, Sonny Terry and Brandy McGee there. Uh, you know, I actually got a chance to play with Professor Long here, uh, Carlin Major, the lady that owned the place. Uh, Professor Longhair was booked in there, and for some reason his drummer was either sick or missed the bus or something. And she calls me up one afternoon and said, would you be willing to just come and play with Professor Longhair? And I'd seen him in New Orleans a couple of times at Tipitino, so I said, God, I love that guy, so I'd love to do it, you know? And another one of those things where after you hang up the phone, you go, oh my God, I gotta, <laughs> now I'm gonna play with Professor Longhair. So, but once again, you, when I got there, they were very friendly and immediately me and the bass player hit it off and we had a good groove. And so it was a good gig. I was really um, excited about having that under my belt that I got a chance to play with Professor Longhair, just one of the one of the great all time New Orleans uh, piano players and singers. And and uh, um, uh, let me see another time while the Cobras were, were playing um, gigs in Austin, there was a club down, I think it was like on 4th and Brazos. I think it was just an old warehouse back then, but it was called Club Foot. And we played several gigs there and then got a chance to open for James Brown two nights. And so I got a chance to meet him. And that was one of the good things about Austin. Lots of times that you'd, you'd be called upon to maybe if you couldn't fill a house, you'd, you'd open for somebody else, put you on the bill. And so um, the second night that we, put, we, we opened for James Brown, I can't remember if it was actually Mr. Brown or his manager came and asked me to leave my drum kit up there for the second show because he's going to have somebody sit in or something. I said, well, of course, you know, because I wouldn't go anywhere. I was going to stay and watch James Brown anyway. So I left my drum kit up there. And in the middle of James Brown's show, he goes back there and starts playing my drums. I don't know if he was going to try to show his drummer some new licks or something, but uh, so I've still got that drum kit, of course. <laughs> still got the sticks he used, but uh, that was some, one, of the, one of the, you know, those magic nights just, just happened out of the blue. You really never planned for stuff like that, but it was just, we look back at it now and go, God, we were having so much fun. We didn't realize we were actually making history. 